Good morning and good afternoon to everyone who has joined us today uh, for this exciting and what we hope would be an informative discussion uh, for the life sciences and healthcare professionals, especially for the folks who are in the front, front trenches of meeting the challenges and the resulting opportunities that we would be discussing today. Uh, my name is Shahid Bhatti and I'm a director uh, at ISG. I will be the moderator and the host today. I had the pleasure of cooperating uh, with Michael Fullwood, uh, an ISG partner in writing a white paper titled Great Expectations, the 2023 Imperatives for the CPOs in the Life Sciences Industry, uh, which has been sponsored by WNS Denali. I would be remiss if I did not mention a number of subject matter experts in ISG research and marketing teams and the active input provided by a number of WNS Denali subject matter experts in writing this paper. A uh, quick housekeeping note, uh, please submit your questions in the chat. We will be answering questions at the end of the discussions. We have some time allocated for it. So, uh, so we look forward to your questions and uh, you know, uh, providing the answers. Joining me today is a distinguished panel of both procurement and life sciences thought leaders, uh, starting with uh, Saju, who is, who is the global supplier capability and uh, governance lead for BMS. Saju, if you would uh, introduce yourself. Thank you, Shahid, and thank you uh, to everyone who's participating in this conversation. Uh, my name is Saju Joseph. I have around 20 years experience in operational and technology transformation across industries. Uh, the last three years I've spent uh, uh, my time in Bristol Myers Squibb uh, looking after supplier governance. Mainly my role is really focused on ensuring our book of work in outsourcing is valued and used to the best possible way in, within BMS. Okay, Adrian. Thank you, Shahid. So very nice to, uh, to spend an hour almost with you. So my name is Adrian Villard. I'm the head of R&D procurement at uh, Helion. So um, Helion is a, is a world leading consumer health company that was born last year from the spin with, uh, with GSK. And within my role, I'm responsible for R&D and innovation procurement, um, supporting R&D activities with a very strong focus on, uh, on the innovation pipeline. Thank you. Mark. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Mark Halford. Um, I lead WNS's life sciences practice. Um, we have the privilege of having about 40 life sciences clients uh, that we um, serve, and that spans not only the globe, but uh, pharmaceuticals, consumer health. Uh, we're in the research and commercial space, and we sell multiple service lines into that base. So. Hopefully that gives me quite a broad view of the procurement uh, challenges and opportunities uh, across the, the value chain. I think as per the title, we're right to have great expectations in these times of uh, great change, um, but hopefully there'll be no uh, prison ships or fights to the death like there were in the original Dickens book. Great, thank you so much, Mark. And last but not least, Julie. Thank you. My name's Julie Brignac. I am the Global Business Unit Leader for WNS Denali which is the procurement business of WNS. And uh, we are a business process management partner with global clients providing uh, strategic as well as operational services across the source to pay work stream. So I'm representing today actually uh, being the strategic partner uh, for our clients and what we see across our clients, across industries and then specific to life sciences and healthcare. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Well, thank you all for your introductions. Um, much appreciated. So I'll kick us off with some perspective. Uh, you know, procurement leaders and their teams, uh, they're typically perceived as having a traditional mindset and approach with a focus on short-term opportunities such as cost savings, uh, operational continuity and meeting internal stakeholders' requests. Uh, you know, this short-term focus would make the Egyptian scribes, the original uh, procurement professionals who manage procurements, procurement of the goods and services uh, to track the building of the Great Pyramids 3,000 years ago, it'll actually make them proud as well. We have, sometimes it seems like we haven't evolved that much. So the challenge for procurement leaders is to think 
in ways that would shift this uh, mindset? How do we make procurement an accelerator? Uh, in today's session, we will be discussing this important for, uh, concept with a focus on challenges faced and addressed by life science procurement organizations beyond just reducing cost. And how can we all make this happen in 2023 and beyond, as just Mark uh, alluded in his introductions. So in life sciences uh, organizations, they are facing quite a few new challenges. Uh, interestingly, the obstacles for uh, life science procurement uh, don't always resemble those of uh, procurement organizations in other industries. Uh, as part of this white paper, uh, we conducted a study of Fortune 3000 life sciences procurement leaders, and we asked the survey respondents, uh, you know, what were some of the greatest challenges? And I'll shift a little bit uh, and show you the results uh, of that particular uh, survey. And as you can see on the screen, um, you know, we asked what are the most important geopolitical challenges, not only organizational challenges, but at the highest level, what are the challenges that are, you are seeing, um, you know, in today's world? And as you can see, there is a marked difference between uh, the respondents in all industries versus how life science industry leaders see some of the challenges. So whereas inflation in non-labor goods and supply chain disruptions are top of mind for all respondents, for life sciences, uh, it's the lack of supplier diversity, it is the talent uh, shortage, uh, the recession fears that are much more prevalent uh, and top of mind for uh, procurement professionals in the life sciences space. So with that in mind, I would invite Adrian to provide his perspective on what are some of the challenges, Adrian, you're seeing as a practitioner in the life science space, um, <clears throat> confronting not only your organizations, but uh, the industry in general. Thank you, Shahid. Um, yeah, it's an interesting graph. So I think, you know, the, the last three years for me, um, from a procurement perspective, have been hectic. And I'm afraid that supply chain are still unlikely uh, to return to complete normality in 2023. Um, I think we continue to experience material shortage, um, labor shortage, um, the geopolitical situation in some countries like Russia, Ukraine, you know, it's, it's difficult uh, creating uncertainty. Uh, we have escalation in Taiwan, in China, and, and there are you know, big stuff potentially coming, coming our way. Um, at a macroeconomic uh, level, um, you have several economies also starting to um, share or show early sign of recessions. Um, and I think that entire context is a context of inflation and uh, volatility. So to me, procurement functions continue to face major challenges um, and such uh, challenges um, have made um, let's say the way we have been operating almost obsolete the last years, and they have pushed the, the procurement model to, uh, to change. Today, I think there is no space for one size fit all uh, in procurement. And when you look at category levels, some are still with severe uh, supply constraints, rising prices and, um, and big uh, supply uh, challenges that requires solutions to be developed by, um, by cross-functional team and business partnering. At the same time, you have other categories where pricing is, is back to normal or declining, pushing procurement to actively bring the value back to, uh, to the business and to, to the PNL. Um, you, you said earlier, so the role of procurement you know, is essential to protect the margin and, and to contain uh, cost escalation. Absolutely, especially in, 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 in today's context. Um, I think procurement can help to solve many of the business challenges, but the key point here is we, we cannot do it um, alone. So we cannot act by ourselves as, as a function within, uh, within the company. Um, supplier risk, business continuity to me, um, um, remain at the top of, of a procurement um, function priority. So maybe, um, a bit in contradiction to what you were sharing uh, earlier, but I think that's remained very high at the agenda. And it's clear that the organizations need to, um, to continue 
uh, learning how to anticipate and how to manage evolving risks in order to maintain the business continuity. Um, disruption will continue. Um, it's hard to predict when and, 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 and where, uh, but to me that's where procurement as well as other senior leaders need to, uh, to stay focused on building agility in, in the organizations. That is great perspective, Adrian. And building upon that, Mark, you're a thought leader in the life sciences industry. Uh, based on what Adrian said and what I shared, can you give us your perspective on what are some of the challenges that you're seeing and uh, do they resonate with what we just shared? Yeah, so um, well, well said, Adrian. I, I want to speak uh, mainly under the banner of uh, driving uh, change and the change that's happening to the industry and the change that the industry needs to uh, make happen. And the, the first thing I'd like to make is a, a possible distinction for people to think about in terms of direct procurement and indirect procurement. You may have different priorities and slightly different lenses on things. So supplier diversity, if you have a manufacturer who's your only supplier of a particular compound that's critical to your blockbuster drug, you know that's pretty important to diversify that situation. Uh, conversely, in indirect uh, procurement, it might be more beneficial to consolidate um, in, in that situation. So I think, I think that's a key distinction um, in life sciences and procurement. The second thing which I'd call out is the shifting and multiplicity of um, stakeholders. Um, you know, technology is becoming um, ever more powerful than a number of categories. Of course, there's the business itself and the finance and procurement uh, functions. And they, we often find that their agenda, their targets, and a word I'd like to introduce, incentives, um, you may not all align. Uh, they may not all align in terms of direction or in terms of uh, timing, you're being short-term or long-term objectives. You know, and there's, there's the old phrase that you get the behavior that you reward. So I think there's an a problem around incentives currently and, and an opportunity to, um, to look at that as well. And then if we look at uh, ways, means, and ends to say things like automate, self-service, artificial intelligence it is all well and good, but these are concepts. They're not structured business cases and they're not uh, well thought out target states that can be uh, the efficiencies and effectiveness of which can be uh, thought out by procurement and the correct way and the, the means that are required you know, be, be, be well specified. So I think, think there's a challenge there in not just identifying areas of change, but being very specific with what the change is and what the change um, is not. Uh, and then the last couple of things from me, I think levering, not leveraging knowledge um, is critical here because uh, procurement, no matter how much it tries to upskill itself, is certainly not going to be the custodian you know, of all of the um, knowledge necessary to drive such quantum change. So the internal view is likely to be incomplete, even if you have internal operations. Uh, the current vendors may suit the as-is scenario, but perhaps not the to-be scenario. And some of the top uh, consulting firms you know, may provide directional statements, but they're often not detailed enough to actually implement um, as a plan. So sometimes there's a gap between the direction and the detailed planning. Um, and the last problem, which I, I know um, is a particular problem in part of life sciences, which is wage inflation. Uh, I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, you want to control the cost, but on the other hand, you want the top talent in your organization to drive um, the big picture and the changes that you're, you're looking for. Great, great perspective. Um, Saju, if I bring you in based on what Mark and Adrian have uh, talked about, uh, can you give us your viewpoint on some of the challenges that you're seeing? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think that was really uh, good. I think you, uh, Adrian and Mark, you really captured a lot of what's going on in the industry. Uh, I would break it into two parts. There is this whole thing about doing it better. And yes, uh, um, uh, we have to uh, we have to manage talent better. Uh, if you look at our drug portfolio, you have stable drugs where you need to you know where we are positioned for market leadership. There are new drugs which we where we really need to make an entry. Um, uh, uh, we are seeing the fragmentation in our portfolio that has increased over the last few years. So there is a lot of pressure to get the entire life cycle from procure to pay, uh, source to contract, uh, risk management done better. And really uh, the challenge there, we are seeing the underlying challenges. We're not able to do it as uh, better as quickly as we want to. 
And a lot of that comes from procurement being very traditional in its uh, uh, mindset. Uh, fundamentally, what we see there is uh, um, the lack of integrated systems and proper analytics and really understanding what's going on and what do we need to address has become a big challenge in that space. But we have a larger challenge, which is doing it differently. It's not enough to uh, uh, even do it better because regulations, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, drugs are getting off patent much faster now. We have a lot of, uh, uh, we really need to be global. And that's where you picked on a good friend uh, uh, about diversity, supplier diversity. In our industry, it's a lot more fundamental because it's also, we supply diversity is hand in hand with patient equity. And you can't go in there and, you know, really go out, there, go, out go out with large drug um, uh, uh, um, releases when you are only focusing on one kind of patient. You need to be a lot more broad-based from your trials to your marketing, to your sales, et cetera. BMS, for example, we are a global company, more than $40 billion. But I was looking at our marketing spend uh, out of maybe uh, $280 million in marketing spend, 245 is based in the US, right? So uh, there is a lot of, uh, there is a need for us to really broad base. And that is driven by procurement. And procurement now acts as a consultant, not just in the uh, area of supply diversity, where we are really looking for diversity of thought uh, for innovation, but also in building up a, a, a framework so the research, uh, drug discovery, drug testing, et cetera, is also more broad based. So the two parts to it, they're doing the whole process better and doing it differently and doing it differently with a different mindset has become um, a priority today. That was a great point around diversity, uh, Saju. I think that resonates a lot with what we are seeing at ISG as well. So really appreciate your insights into that. Julie, you're working with clients all the time and you know, you're, and actually your horizon is a little bit broader from this fact that you know, you're in the trenches with multiple clients. How do you see uh, uh, those clients, uh, you know, one, seeing these challenges and also addressing some of these challenges? Yeah, all great points uh, that my fellow panelists have made. And I want to pick up on a few things that I heard to be able to answer your question. So um, one, actually, Adrian, you talked about the supply chains not normal. What we talk about with clients and what we see to be able to try to shift the thinking, which of course resonates throughout the procurement function, is that it's a new normal. So then that goes to many of the other points uh, that were made in terms of the agility, the flexibility uh, that we need to do to define what that new normal is. And that new normal is the new normal can actually uh, be differentiated across industries, right, depending on the priorities, the business requirements, and even quite honestly, uh, where a client is in terms of their maturity. Because we talk a lot, we work with clients a lot, and we talk about the ecosystem. We talk about being able to support our clients in any area of the ecosystem to make sure that they have all the components necessary to be able to define that new normal, to be able to drive the transformation. Uh, uh, Saju, you talked about uh, being a consultant. Well, we like to think about it in terms of the trusted advisor because at the end, it's, it's about developing the relationships, which is also very important. If you're the trusted advisor, if you're helping the client mature, uh, if you're helping them stay one step ahead of where they would be versus if they didn't work with a trusted advisor, then of course, that's, that's what's key to be able to try to lead through some of the challenges. I also would like to pick up on the fact around uh, diversifying. And, and it's very important. I find, we find that across the clients, uh, regardless of what their supply chain looks like, whether it's direct, indirect, et cetera, um, that it's very important that you recognize that oftentimes um, it's, you have to focus in finding the, the diverse suppliers because the challenges in the supply chain and the diversification of the supply base are definitely related in terms of the options that our clients have. And so while that may seem like an obvious statement, you have to double click one level down and say, well, but, but how are they related? What are the industry dynamics? What are the supply chain dynamics? How do we solve for that? And the solutions is where that really comes into play. 
We talk a lot about tools. We talk about digital, talk about all those things that can help. But at the end of the day, it's not the tools that really drive that. It's the entire solution that you bring. And if you, we, what we do with our clients and what we see is to be able to bring that in in the terms of the ecosystem so that we can, you know, you have to customize the solutions for the clients. And I think that's what's, what's really key in terms of being able to uh, manage the risk. Uh, the importance of the business continuity plans to be able to provide the agility and the flexibility. And therefore that goes into, well, that's how you do it differently, but you do it better as well. So that's how we approach it with our clients. And quite honestly, what we're seeing is the tailored customized approach, but put it in the, the bubble of the ecosystem thinking. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. And thank you all. I think it was great perspective around, you know, some of the challenges uh, we are seeing in the marketplace today from a procurement perspective. But let's, uh, you know, shift the discussion with the focus on life sciences even more. Uh, the leaders in life sciences are pushing for greater per, uh, precision and personalization with the therapeutic, th therapeutics and improved uh, patients' experience. Uh, the pace of advancement, you know, that's really swift. Optimizing the supply chain requires uh, involvement of key stakeholders, as we've already pointed out, uh, outside even the direct manufacturing organization. So Adrian, let me start with you again, uh, because you have direct experience with these challenges as your role as the head of R&D procurement organizations. What are the challenges you're seeing from that perspective and uh, how are you addressing those challenges? So Shaila, I think that's a very broad question. <laughs> so I will maybe try to narrow this down um, a bit. Um, I think what, what I see today is, you know, with the, the COVID pandemic, the healthcare, the entire healthcare industry has, has seen tremendous growth and innovation. Um, with that, on one side, we have seen um, some drastic changes in the way patient consumers and their healthcare providers um, were working, collaborating. We have seen the development of new models that are much more consumer and patient centric and, and more convenient. So that's that's the first step. On, on another side, um, we experience, we have experience and, and that will continue an unprecedented explosion in, um, in the data being available, uh, patient personal data. And over a lifetime, a single person will generate huge quantity of data. And we talk about millions of books of data. And, and today that data is, is, so that information, that data is, is trapped in silos. So where I want to, to go here is to me, the, the future of healthcare is personalized. I think that was part also of, of the, the white paper and the data generated and the new technologies will help to recommend new treatments, new proactive treatments as well. Um, in that context, if I would like to deep dive on clinical research, and that's an area that is absolutely critical for, uh, for the industry. Um, and that specific area face severe challenges in, in recruitment complexity or, or compliance. Um, at the same time, th that the, the clinical research is really open to innovation. So, um, at, at Alien, we combine trusted science with deep human understanding, and it's really about the, the, the human elements, the patient element, the, the consumer or patient experience with the science. And here, so the clinical team, um, jointly with the procurement organization, they play a key role, um, of course, to manage the, the research partners. Uh, but I think more interestingly, um, to work with them and find new innovation in that space. And at the end, it's about trust. It's about the patient experience that I was describing. It's about technology and, and finally, and that's connected about cost. Um, everything we do in that space is, is um, based on trust and we need to continue to build trust. So patient trust in regulatory authority as well as clinical research um, is absolutely fundamental to continue um, successful clinical trials. So that's the first step. The second one is when uh, we experience today a higher adoption of hybrid trial design or decentralized uh, clinical uh, study. Um, 
and it seems that one of the main driver is is um, this facilitate a more patient centric approach. So that's that's an absolutely fascinating changes, uh, probably driven by by COVID and some of the um, travel constraint we uh, we had. Um, all of this being possible with the support of new technologies. Um, so clinical research is is uh, absolutely essential, uh, and innovation in in um, uh, clinical trials um, is also key, and that will change the way we work in uh, in the in the industry. And to me, my last word would be um, that's especially true as um, real world evidence and real world data have become more and more accepted by regulators. Great, thank you, and Julie, building on what. Um, Adrian just mentioned, you know, what are some of the digital enablement, digital transformation challenges that we are seeing and what are, and how are they addressing the challenges that Adrian described? Well, I think Adrian made some very key points if I take, because you're talking a lot about the research and, and the necessary factors. There are so many parallel points that you made that are relevant to how we have to think about it in procurement to be able to overcome those challenges. For example, speaking with the data, that's of course just paramount. So if you equate that to digital technologies and the enablement of that, then of course you have to be able to do something with the data and you also have to be able to adapt more importantly to the ever changing data that is coming in, right? So that we can, so, cause we work with clients to be able to produce the outcomes. Uh, and I think another point that you made was around the process, the challenges. When we talk about digital enablement, it's so important. And I think this is a, a well-known concept or statement that uh, you, you, can't, you won't have a, a digital enablement or a digital tool or even a digital solution if you don't have the processes right uh, to begin with. And of course, from a procurement support standpoint, whether it's R&D or, or actually supporting any other function uh, within our clients, we have to constantly take a look at the processes to be able to try to drive the efficiency. That's what the clients expect of us. The challenge is, is again, as businesses uh, are diverse as mergers and acquisitions come into play, which of course we're in a very, very busy cycle, seems you know, globally where that's concerned, your processes can get quite muddied. And so again, that's where the digital enablement actually over, helps overcome those challenges, right? To be able to bring the data together to do something, to be able to drive the outcomes. The last thing I would say is around the human element. That was really a very powerful statement because in procurement and being a strategic partner to clients, the human element, we always talk about procurement will always have a human element. Procurement always must have a human element, whether it's on the managed partner side, whether it's on the client side and, and digital will not fully, that should not, should not fully replace procurement. It shouldn't because the human ele elements that you talked about, Adrian, versus the human elements partnering with the procurement organization, those, those are key to be able to drive a lot of decisions to recognize the efficiencies and then be able to apply the right digital tools and solutions to be able to, to get the outcomes that you want. Great, thank you. And Mark, if you wanna build upon that, based on your uh, viewpoint as an industry leader, uh, rather than being a pure play procurement professional like most of us here, <laughs> what would be your viewpoint? Sure, well, great points by my uh, fellow panelists, uh, first of all. So the first thing I would say under the personalization banner is we have to say, well, who is the customer we're personalizing to? Uh, and clearly that, that's multiple. It's primarily um, uh, healthcare uh, professionals uh, and of course uh, patients, you know, and under healthcare professionals that breaks down into uh, um, chemists, you know, pharmacists, as well as doctors and uh, consultants uh, and all. So when we say personalization, I think it's really important to be clear on who we're personalizing to, which are very different audiences. Um, and when we talk about healthcare uh, professionals and how this is going to affect procurement, it's now becoming uh, past the early adopter uh, phase that the right channel, the right timing, the right message, uh, the relevant therapy area, um, and other segmentation and targeting criteria are, are all considered before you communicate with a healthcare professional, um, alongside things like wanting to be able to pull the information, not just have it uh, pushed at them. 
Um, and of course, there's the uh, the balance between the uh, the physical and the digital um, within that as well. Um, most pundits are predicting that the current engagement model with healthcare professionals will be entirely disrupted uh, within five years. You know, and bearing in mind that drives most of the top line of the life sciences business. Um, you know, to this day, that that's a pretty uh, important thing to have a handle on, on what's going on. Um, some of the changes we're seeing in that space is utilizing healthcare system data. Um, is no longer a sort of dream of the future. You know, we're seeing uh, several startups that have managed to integrate with the electronic health record. Um, so they can actually um, communicate with the HCP at the point of prescription or at the point of uh, dispensing, um, as well as accessing things like healthcare professional unstructured data to get more insights into what is the experience of the product, um, you know, not just whether they're um, aware of the products. Um, and then also it's um, the diagnostic support and the chronic care support for healthcare professionals. So it's not just knowing about your product, it's also what is their experience of using your product. So, so what from a procurement point of view? Well, that means that the internal and external capabilities that are currently in place are, are gonna have to fundamentally change um, you know, to protect and drive that top line of the, um, the business. Um, and then if I comment from a patient's uh, perspective, the demand for disease information, we see that going nothing but up all of the time. Um, and that's partly driven by changes in the population and their attitudes and behaviors toward, towards health, but also uh, only still about 50% of people, broadly speaking, actually stick to their meds. Um, so there's a huge commercial opportunity as well as a clinical opportunity um, in, in adherence uh, from personalization. We see DNA being used in multiple therapy areas in terms of diagnostic support and ongoing care support. Um, and of course, predictive analytics that comes from all of this data is ultimately going to affect your portfolio investments, you know, both in terms of what you're investing in um, and what you want to uh, divest you know, when you start to have these sort of predictive uh, views of the world. And just to, you know, I sort of mentioned for the consumer health industry, which is just as impacted by this personalized wellness you know, is here to stay now. I can have my DNA taken and have personalized vitamins sent to my uh, front door as well. So a huge change from the uh, sort of one size fits all uh, approach. And again, the, um, you know, can internal and current suppliers define what that change looks like, let alone deliver that? Um, you know, chances are probably not. So uh, probably goes back to our diversification uh, question uh, in a world where everything's getting uh, disrupted. Okay. Great. And Saju, I think, uh, you know, you're driving business partnering and building vendor uh, innovation ecosystems. How does that play in the topic that we're discussing? And what is your uh, viewpoint in terms of, you know, how vendors are helping uh, address this challenge? Yeah, I think a lot of great points. And, you know, if you ask me, vendors and the ecosystem really is underpinning the entire almost every point that you spoke about. I'll just touch upon a few things. Um, I think some uh, Adrian talked about speed, right? And, you know, when we launched, I suppose they are Angels, we, we, had, we had drugs uh, delivered, I think a couple of hours after we got FDA approval. Our window of opportunity is so narrow today that we have to move far faster than you ever did before. And that means that our relationship with our vendors, um, the expectations that we have, the, the finances, et cetera, have changed dramatically. It's, it's, you know, we just cannot build out these uh, structures when we need to. We need to do it earlier. We need to plan for it. And there's been a lot of change in the entire way we've been set up in our op model just to handle that speed. Personalization also is very interesting. We talked about multiple, uh, you know, the need for patient data and uh, doctors and HCPs, et cetera. You know, we, it's, but people, the transformation is tremendous. We are moving from this world of, you know, one tablet if you're below 18 and two if you're an adult, right? To really designing medicines for a person, your DNA, your, or even your personality. That's really the future of uh, medicine. Some of our best talent within BMS is all moving into CAR T because that's really where all our innovation is. We have to change the entire ecosystem to be able to address that profitably. It is, and uh, uh, I see more of medicine uh, uh, moving into that space, and which means that 
uh, from a procurement perspective, our ability to uh, add value across the supply chain, I think we are best placed to do that. Our ability to, to uh, influence that and make that happen has been uh, uh, under a lot of pressure, really. And uh, that's one area uh, that we will all be focused on. From a procurement perspective, someone, I think Julie talked about uh, the human angle, right? And uh, um, that is that is where business partnering comes in because uh, let me take an example of diversity, supplier diversity. It's not enough getting a diverse supplier. You have to make them win. And the role of procurement has really shifted from being the group that gets you access to a way of doing things to actually ensuring you get it done. And that means that the upstream work that we do is non-traditional procurement. It's really a cross-industry type of skill set that we are building, building. And so it's the entire for us, the vehicle for that are our business partners, our business partnering function. And we are investing tremendously in that because if you want this change to happen, you should be there to make it happen. It is not just in, in procurement, it could be something like uh, increasing your uh, uh, clinical trial spread, right? So what we do now is we have programs where we uh, uh, train ambassadors in less than marginalized communities, because you need to go to those communities and explain to them and um, address their specific cultural issues. And that's part of procurement, because we are that's part of our supply chain. So the change in the way a procurement professional actually manages this uh, ecosystem has been a, uh, significant. And we believe that the business partnering function within BMS is actually key to doing that. So guys, great discussion so far. Uh, I, I think as last part of this webinar, what we wanted to focus and have a discussion on was, um, you know, as, as procurement look, uh, leaders are looking to the future, uh, you know, how do they build that procurement organization of the future and maybe reinvent the procurement, procurement organizations or, you know, uh, address the challenges that they, uh, you know, uh, uh, are looking to from a future perspective. So I'm going to do a real quick graph. I'll sh uh, throw it up. And then Saju, I will ask you to continue your uh, discussion, uh, you know, from a from a leader perspective. On here's some of the challenges that uh, we identified uh, from, uh, you know, the the life sciences procurement leaders and also the rest of the industry. You know, how do we address these challenges over the next uh, 24 months? So the challenges are around uh, number one, increasing spend on the management, uh, which, uh, which has been a traditional procurement forte. But I think based on the discussions we've had, you know, it points to the fact that, um, uh, you know, procurement organizations need to evolve, uh, increasing their reactivity to business demand. And the third was around improving staff skill set. So I'll kick it off with you and then I'll go around the table real quick. Uh, with the other uh, panelists as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Sasha. You know, I think this is a uh, this is a great uh, start because um, with all the changes that are happening, let's not forget that core procurement deliverables are critical. If we if we take our eyes off that ball, everything collapses. So, uh, uh, increasing spend on management is something that we do. Uh, but while doing that, uh, it's it's a big focus area for us, and I'll. You know, sort of tell you how we did that, but you're also really looking at the quality of that uh, interaction. The way BMS uh, uh, approached this was um, uh, we did two things, I think, that uh, made a difference. One is um, we started planning and changing our op model early from around 2016. Because as someone said, process is critical. You you can't, you know, you need to change your op model to be able to address this, uh, um, uh, these kind of uh, uh, dynamic nature of industry changes that we are seeing. So for us, it was really about breaking your procurement function into critical, in, into groups, business partnering, sourcing excellence, BPNS, uh, procurement operations. And it took us around two or three years to do that because once you build that, you have flexibility in terms of uh, strategy. 
The second uh, thing that we did and which has been very useful is continuous benchmarking. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, benchmarking is almost like your uh, like a medical checkup. There is a use in going and doing a checkup once in a year, but it's really important to do a, your, look at your yearly data and see how you're trending. So uh, this practice of really drilling down and understanding how we fare against, against the industry, against peers, uh, over the last three or four years where it was able to really help us understand where and what were we doing well and badly. And while we were in the you know, upper quartile in many of the areas you talked about in, in the graph, Shai, what we saw was analytics and systems, integration of systems were where we were lacking. And so if you look at the graph, we were up in most areas. Those are the two areas. And if you step back and say, why were we slow in a lot of our strategies? It is because fundamentally our users remain traditional because they did not have new processes. They did not have new systems. And it took us too long to integrate the siloed best-in-class systems we were deploying. So really, the uh, 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 what we have done over the last six months has been to be able to uh, move our entire procurement organization in the integrated operations, technology, and process uh, a model underpinned by a, a platform called Intelligent Procurement, where we are actually now integrating our data models, our processes, so procurement professionals can have that flexibility. And I think from the, it's not that there are other key areas that we're looking at, but this is an area we believe will be a strategic differentiator for uh, BMS. Um, Adrian, uh, you know, aligning procurement objectives to business procurement objectives, that has been a, a big topic for the uh, procurement organization of the future. If you want to elaborate a little bit around that topic and, uh, you know, uh, give your viewpoint. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, procurement has come a long way to being recognized as a strategic function that can deliver bottom line savings. Um, I think the business partnership element is super important. We discussed earlier today about uh, acting as a consultant or as a trusted advisor. And um, to me, it requires to, uh, to shift on, on three key, uh, key elements. The first one is a financial topic. Um, I think it's critical that procurement aligned with the business and not only with finance. Um, the big shift, in my opinion here, is moving from a procurement narrative to a business narrative. I think too often procurement comes with a, a story driven by procurement tool, procurement analytics, procurement of looking at category and spend, and not necessarily with you know, business terminology used in, in the budget uh, planning. So to me, that's, that's the first step. Um, the second one is um, being stakeholder centric. By stakeholder centric, again, I think we are coming with a procurement organization. We should, we should change that mind and to, to look at how to make the life of my stakeholders easier. And the last one, and maybe as important or maybe the most important, is a deep, human, a deep understanding of the stakeholders' objectives. I think too often in, in the past, you know, uh, the values group including procurement are focused on their own um, challenges. I think here it is, how do we change it? And I believe that once we have done those three um, shift really about the budget, the stakeholder centricity and the deep understanding of the stakeholder objective, then the quality of the discussion will change. Uh, Mark, uh, maybe you can uh, provide your uh, view on what you're expecting from the procurement organization of the future? Yeah, no problem. I know we're a little short on time, so I'll keep it brief. Um, something which I hugely uh, aligned with uh, Adrian was my uh, first point as well, is aligning these objectives, these uh, uh, um, incentives um, across procurement technology, uh, the business. And I think sometimes longer term planning may be needed in that regard as well, because sometimes what's within quarter or financial year is not a horizon that can actually deliver the order of change that's um, required. So I think some of those plans need to be a little bit longer uh, as well. I think getting into very clear defined target states that can be accurately costed in terms of their effectiveness and their efficiency 
um, which um, goes to my next point about this whole audit analysis and design phase, which can only really be done uh, with all of the other stakeholders and um, making sure that all of the available knowledge, whether it's from benchmarking, whether it's from internal providers, existing providers or consultants, but making sure you really understand where you are and leverage all of the knowledge uh, that's out there. And then my last comment would be the whole sort of yeah, great resignation and retention of um, talent. Um, I, I think it's a false economy to try and overly control uh, wage inflation. You know, the, the resources that can drive these sort of changes um, are in very high demand. That, that, that's just the reality. So uh, I think uh, measuring the impact of that top talent rather than the cost of that tech talent and making sure they're working for you rather than for somebody else is a, is a key. Sorry, and Julie, if you want to bring us home while synthesizing all the comments for the organization of the future, I know we're running a little bit over time. We do have one question. We'll try to address that as well. Okay, well, thank you for allowing me to do that. So I think uh, some of the key elements, uh, all of you, right, speaking previously around this have really touched on it. And of course, thinking as a, a strategic partner, you're telling us what do you expect from an organization, right, like ours. And I think, uh, again, bringing that that uh, thought, that thought leadership, uh, Mark, you talked about driving um, effectiveness and efficiency and defining that for the clients. That's what, our, or even your internal or external clients, right, is really important. But then also back to uh, the spend under management piece of it, and that's the top priority, right? That That goes to the reach. Right. It's talking about uh, defining the reach and how we do that. And I think all of you have touched on those really key elements, benchmarking, because benchmarking actually shifts the reactive nature of procurement that allows you to get ahead of that. In a lot of cases, if you have your proper digital enablers, your tools, your analytics to be able to try to drive it to a proactive so I think that's what the procurement organization of the future really needs to focus on is allowing and supporting the stakeholders, the business owners, and how, what the objectives are defined to be more in a proactive piece of it. And I think a big part of that is procurement is always the uh, steward of really driving the cost savings. So if we take that and we back away from that, because that's a very important element, it's a very important role that procurement organizations play. But if you back that up and really think about it more strategically, what else do we bring? Then that's really important. And then I'll end with uh, what Mark talked about, which is around the talent, because what you described is the value that brings, right? So, and value can be defined in very different ways, not just how much how much cost savings was generated, how much uh, more spend under, under management did we achieve, et cetera. But it's a much larger objective to be able to define to those outcomes that we talked about earlier. Okay, great. Thank you, Julie. Hey, uh, I realized we're a little bit over time. We have one question, uh, which is around uh, sustainable procurement in relation to clinical research. Saju, while you, if you want to take a shot at answering that question, and then we can wrap it up. Oh yeah, um, I'll give it a shot um, because sustainable procurement is a broad term. For us, it's almost like a culture, right? There are multiple um, elements to that. It's in consistency. It's ensuring that we are. Uh, it's ensuring that we uh, develop uh, diversity, innovation, um, uh, the whole sus uh, aligning with sust our sustainability goals, etc. So for us, uh, it's it's been actually lifted up as a culture that defines almost everything we do in procurement, and within research, um, it, it's manifested itself across the way we are uh, managing our trials, markets, the globalization of our delivery centers, um, uh, our partner our, our ecosystem, etc. So. Uh, I think that's the way we've been uh, looking at it. And uh, um, for it to work, it has to be integrated into operations. And from my perspective, leading uh, governance, uh, it's really been important to bring in sort of sustainability into all our, our ecosystem through governance. Okay, great. Thank you, Saju. Hey, guys, I really appreciate all the panelists and all the participants for joining today. Uh, just a quick closing statement. You know, we... Uh, we know procurement has to adopt and change. 
We today's world requires the life sciences CPO to be agile, nimble, evolve at the rapid pace of science itself, embrace the change, and use this as an opportunity uh, to provide competitive organization to their respective organizations. So, if you guys have any other questions, first of all, I would encourage you to download the white paper. Uh, please reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to reach out to the panelists and respond to you with any other questions that you might have. Uh, with that, again, thank you for the panelists and the participants. Be well, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk again soon. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.